Good morning, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, Ophthalmology Grand Rounds here at the Moran Eye Center. I'm Kathleen Digby and I'm the chair of the library committee. And every year we come to you to talk about what new resources are at the Bloomberg Library and also through the Eccles Health Sciences Library. And of course, give you an update on Moran Core. And I do want to thank our library committee. We have a very active committee. We meet every other month. The Moran Core Editorial Board meets two to four times a year. And as you can see on our committee, we not only have faculty, but we have residents, and then we have staff uh, because we, it's really important. And of course, our library partners come to those meetings as well. And so we're going to start out with a report from the editor of the Moran Core. Griffin and Griffin is online and off in a clinic. So Griffin, I'll run your slides for you, but you can start. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, speak up a little bit. Okay, I'll I'll speak up and try to get close. Um, forgive me for being remote, but uh, it's a wonderful thing that we can do to still kind of present together. I um, first want to just thank Kathleen. Um, Kathleen is just such an inspiring leader, and it's been such a privilege to work with Dr. Degree and. A, a few different capacities, and uh, she's just led this committee with such enthusiasm as she does so many things in her career and life, and just appreciate her wonderful, inspirational leadership. Um, you can advance the slide, Kathleen. We also have, um, I also want to thank the, you know, we, we've we had, we've given kind of more and more responsibility and autonomy to our section editors and um and everybody has uh, taken ownership of their own section and um, really added a lot of content, a lot of organization, and it's it's really taken off. Um, so I want to thank all these people on, on this page. And I also want to make a, a side point about um, Rancor. Uh, in, in a recent meeting with uh, educators from all over the country, um, I had at least a dozen people ask me about how how we were able to create this resource and how it was able to become so popular so quickly. And, and it became a, really clear to me that um, programs and residents and medical students all over the country and, 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 and many degrees all over the world are really using this resource. And it's uh, it, what's incredible, is, as you all know, is you search um, almost any ophthalmologic disease or disorder a Moran Core link will often be one of the first three to five hits. And, and that's a sign that Google is recognizing um, its popularity, its prominence, and, and that works into the algorithm. The more it's used, the more it kind of becomes a um, higher on that search list. And I, I just was acknowledged, uh, or I had several people acknowledge from all over the country, what a wonderful resource this is and how often it's getting used. And, and so I wanna thank everybody really, the section editors and all those in the department who submit content to this and all of our many wonderful medical students who've worked on this um, as it really has become an important um, resource for accurate and trustworthy ophthalmologic educational uh, guidance. We you get advance? Um, the uh, I, I wanted to introduce Dr. Begunta um, had put together a new section. So I was just going to highlight just her section briefly kind of for on, on her behalf. She, I think, is uh, operating this morning. We have a um, Moran ophthalmology learning experience. Uh, Dr. Simpson, uh, uh, um, I, I think, was the previous section editor and put a lot of time in Catherine, who has also worked in the section. So there's a lot of people to recognize. But um, Mole is our, uh, has been also a really um, successful and uh, kind of nationally renowned approach to education. And this is such a great resource that, that we can use locally and that we can also share with some of our colleagues on, on how to create um, a, a flipped classroom and um, kind of novel approach to resident education. Um, you could advance, uh, Kathleen, thank you. So just to look at some of these um, subcategories, we have all these instructional videos on, on really basics of how to do it, um, how to create pre-work, how to approach a flipped classroom model, um, some wonderful technological ideas that we have used and some uh, 
um, some exercises to to also look at. So if you're new to mole or still or looking for new ways to be um, uh, kind of innovative in your teaching approach, this is just great material. Uh, you advance it again. Uh, there's some support resources here, and you can kind of advance every about five seconds here. We'll go through these quickly, um, Kathleen. Just some more um, some ideas here, and then um, the division roadmaps. As you can see, I think most divisions have this. This is also for both for residents and for faculty um, to keep track of the roadmap, which adds, I think, a, a, a deliberate purpose to any rotation um, to actually have expectations outlined and kind of the most high yield topics and, and, and articles and, and summary papers written. And so these roadmaps um, also are great for our own program um, to reference throughout the rotation, as well as to share nationally. You can advance again, Kathleen. We have some evidence-based um, support for what we're doing, which um, being a scientific community is so important and you could advance again. And then we've got a handful of lectures here. You can kind of, it's fun to see who, who's offered some of these wonderful lectures, but these are some great examples of how to do it. And um, Ethan also has played such an important role in capturing this information, um, prepping it, uh, and then and then helping our library committee, um, uh, Christy and Brian, who are just phenomenal and put so much work in and in, in allowing us to use their resources to host all this material. And lastly, on the Taco Tuesday, there's just some more information there too. I, I don't think we have that. Uh, so I just want to, again, say thank you to everybody for making this such a successful resource. And I'm going to turn it over to the library committee and, and Kathleen for the rest of the presentation. Any questions for Griffin? Thanks Griffin for attending. Even no, thank you. Virtual. <laughs> All right. Uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Christy Jarvis, who is the Associate Director for Scholarly Communications at Eccles Health Sciences Library. And she does licensing. She helps us get journal access. I meet with her every year, and we go through journals and pricing. And the Eccles Library hosts many, many of our op ophthalmology journals. Bloomberg Library does some, but but the library really does the the giant um, uh, share of it. And uh, every year we ask her to give an update about what's new in uh, Eccles Library and publishing and things that we need to be aware of as faculty members so that we can advance our scholarship. So, Christy. Thank you. Um, as Dr. Degree said, I am here representing the library. Before I hop into my slides, I'd like to ask all of you to spend five seconds, clear your mind, and think about what pops into your head, what mental image pops into your head when I say I am from the library. What is the library? I'm gonna guess that many of you, maybe most of you are picturing a room full of books on shelves that go from wall to wall and floor to ceiling. Um, if you've been to the Eccles Library recently, you will realize that is not what the library looks like. We have very few print books on our shelves, although, side note, we have a very cool collection of casual reading material, medical history, memoirs, popular uh, science. So if you're going on a conference and you don't want to work on your laptop on the plane, swing by the library and check out one of those books. They're lots of fun. But academic content, there's very little print on our shelves, and that's because the library prioritizes online access um, to content. So... Um, Christy, if the library is not a building full of books, what is it? So glad you asked. Okay, I want you to think of the library as a building that's a collection of people who have expertise and skills to help you do your job, teaching, research, patient care. So it's people, friendly, helpful people who are knowledgeable and can help you do some, some things. So this is just kind of some highlighting, highlighting of some of the things that you can ask the library to help you with. So expert literature searching, identifying appropriate databases and search terms. That's kind of a critical one. I have um, discovered that many, if not most faculty across health sciences just assume that PubMed is the database. They should search for everything. PubMed is amazing. 
big fan of PubMed myself, it is not the right tool for every search that you want to run. Um, and so if you're turning to that for literally every information query you have, you may be missing things. So the library can help you identify the correct place to run your search. Um, you may be surprised to learn that we provide access to over 350 databases, and I don't expect you to know which one is the right one for the search you want to run. So just ask us. We can help connect you with the right place to run your search. Um, what are the terms you should you should be using in that database? How do you search effectively? Um, so uh, developing your effective search strategies, um, finding evidence-based information for clinical queries and patient care. Quick side note, the librarians are available to you from within EPIC. You can send our clinical librarians a request for information using the EPIC in-basket function or message basket, I think it's called function. Um, um, so expert searching is a big thing that, again, these people in the library can help you with. Um, saved searches and alerts are an interesting one. If you have a topic that you want to keep up to date on, one of the best strategies for that is to create a search. We'll use PubMed in this example. You can create a search and then set it up to run periodically and just send you alerts. I will say, if you haven't set up your search query very um, efficiently and effectively and very tailored, your search results that are emailed to you are gonna contain a lot of noise and you will very quickly stop reading them because they're not helpful, right? They're not useful, they're just a waste of your time. So if there's something that you wanna follow, ask a librarian to help you set up a very targeted search so that the results you get are actually relevant to you. Um, it'll save you some time, um, both in creating the search yourself and uh, being able to make use of the results that are sent to you. Other things that the library can help you with, data discovery and, and uh, management, citation verification, citation metrics, your NCBI databases and tools, including your NCBI account, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, um, NIH public access compliance, if you need help with that, and then copyright and scholarly publishing, which is another thing I'm gonna jump into. So it's just some of the things that the library, which is not a building full of books, but is a building full of people can help you with. Okay. So generally, when I come um, to this meeting and talk with you all about the library, I focus on the resources that we provide to you. So in your role as a reader in the scholarly communication ecosystem, what are the journals that you have access to? What are the books you have access to? And I'm going to take a slightly different approach this time around and talk about um, your role as an author. So you're not just consumers of content in the scholarly communication ecosystem, most of you whether you like it or not, are also authors, right? You're also submitting um, manuscripts and you're publishing in journals. So um, how many of you, um, never mind, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm going to assume that none of you are nerdy enough that you follow the Office of Science and Technology Policy. No, just me? Okay. So the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, back in 2022 has issued new guidelines for federal funding agencies. Uh, most of you probably know that for several several years, since about 2018, NIH has required um, open access. And I'm going to pause for a minute there and say what I just said is not true. And I actually, when I was putting these slides together and was proofreading them, I was like, oh, I have an error on this slide. And I deliberately didn't correct it because I wanted to leave it up there so I can show you how quickly it is to confuse two concepts. All right. So... In 2018, NIH said, when you when we fund you, you have to make the results of your research available, right? You can't have it behind a paywall. That's not cool. We're giving you money to conduct your research. Taxpayer money, you have to make your, your um, research available. Um, and they had a policy around that. OSTP in 2022 has updated that, expanded it beyond NIH. It's now all federal agencies depend, you know, regardless of how much money they, they uh, dole out in research funding. So all federal agencies have this now that you have to make your content um, available. Um, they do not say in the policy that you have to, that you have to follow, well, it does not say that your, your research output has to be open access. It doesn't say that, even though that's what I put on the slide. What they say is that it has to be made publicly accessible. Public access and open access are terms that are used very interchangeably, like I just did on this slide, but they're actually slightly different concepts. And in some cases, those differences may be important to you. So what the Office of Science and Technology Policy has mandated in their new policy is that um, 
that the results of your research and your data have to be publicly available, not open access. What public access, well, let me uh, explain it like this. Um, public access generally means that your content is available to read and download so that readers, there's no paywall, your content, your article, your data is free to access online and it's free to download. That's what public access means. That is what the OSTP memo uh, requires. Open access, which is the term that most of us are familiar with and we throw around like I did on this slide. Open access tends to mean that the content is available to access online, read online, download, and reuse. That is the piece that NIH does not mandate, they don't require. And that may be important because when you are publishing or sharing your data, you may be totally fine with scholars across the world being able to read it and download it, but you really don't want Big Pharma to reuse it in some way, right? So you can choose to publish your article, make your data available for accessibility, readability, and re and re well and for downloading, but not for reuse. You can say I am not allowing commercial reuse of my content. And that is important because NIH does not require that. But clear, clear as mud. Okay. Yeah. Functionally prevents industry from using that once it's publicly available. Uh, so nothing prevents them, but after the fact you can uh if you have retained copyright to it, which you could, right? You could say, I am holding on to the copyright and I'm not allowing commercial reuse. You could maybe sue Big Pharma for millions of dollars for violating your copyright for having reused it. So no prevention, but after the fact, perhaps uh, an opportunity to get rich and retire early. Um, okay, so since uh, federal funding agencies are gonna require you to make your research output publicly available, and most of us conceptualize that as being open access publishing. Um, a couple of things to keep in mind that um, you are not required, the OSCP does not mandate that you publish in an open access journal, which is one way you could comply. Um, they also don't say, well, it has to be an open access article in a hybrid journal that does both paywalled and open access articles. They don't say you have to do that, but that's one of the options. Um, so option one is open access art, art journal. Option two is hybrid journal. Option three uh, could be depositing a version of your journal, the, usually the author accepted manuscript into a repository, either the repository here at the university, a discipline specific one, um, and the library can help you identify a potential place to deposit your manuscript if that's the route that you wanna take to fulfill your, your funding requirement. Okay, but knowing that now that the federal government has expanded across most federal funding agencies this requirement to have publicly accessible have publicly accessible um, research output, um, the university um, libraries have been having ongoing conversations with the VPR's office about how can we support university authors in meeting this requirement and being able to publish in a an open access forum, whatever that looks like. So one of the things that the libraries and the VPR office did was we took a look across, and this is not just health sciences specific, so realize there's some non-applicable information here, but we looked across the entire campus to see where University of Utah authors are most frequently publishing, right? What publishers have the largest volume of manuscripts from University of Utah authors? Uh, Elsevier was number one, Springer Nature was number two, and then Wiley, Oxford, Taylor and Francis Sage, and American Chemical Society. Probably not surprises um, to most of you. So we looked at all of these publishers and said, can we start negotiating licenses with them where rather than here, we give you big pot of money, you give us access to read your journals. We started approaching all of these publishers and said, if we give you a big pot of money, um, will you allow our patrons at the University of Utah not only to read your journals, but also to publish open access in your journals? And we started having negotiations with all of these. These negotiations are ongoing. Um, some are going better than others. Um, but some of the ones you see here, so Wiley and Oxford are the most recent ones that we were successful in negotiating these licenses with. And we now have open access publishing agreements with Wiley, Oxford, they're the newest ones. We have ones with Cambridge, Carger. Did I say it? 
There's a couple that are close to being finished, but I'm not going to say them yet. Okay, so these are journals where, or these are publishers where all of the journals in their portfolio, the open access article pro article processing charge that is assessed for open access publishing will be covered by the University of Utah. Okay. So I'm going to come back to this for a minute. So what this looks like is when you are submitting a manuscript to a journal that is covered under one of these university licenses, there's nothing that's different at the submission stage, right? There's some people that have been like, oh, well, doesn't that increase my odds of being accepted if I'm publishing OA? It doesn't. And the publisher really doesn't even want to know at the get-go whether you're going to publish open access or not. Now, some journals, that's all they publish is open access. So when you submit a manuscript, the assumption is this will be an open access article. But for hybrid journals, um, you are just going through the submission portal the way you do for any other manuscript. Where the university's agreement comes into play is if and when your manuscript is submitted. If you are, um, or sorry, not submitted, is, is accepted. If your manuscript is accepted, you will receive an email that's like, hey, congratulations, we're gonna publish your article. And for those of you that have been through that process, you realize that generally either in that email or a secondary email, you are invited to log into the publisher's author portal. Right, The author portal is where you get to do things like read your proofs and make corrections and all of that. Um, the author portal is also where if you decide you're going to publish open access, you will be presented with an option to use University of Utah funds to cover the APCs. Say yes to that option. Now, you will not see that option unless, so this is the most important thing, the corresponding author on the manuscript must have identified themselves as having a University of Utah affiliation. So when you are submitting um, um, or in the author portal, when they first send the, the acceptance, there is a, hey, we have you identified as being as part of this university, is this correct? Um, and if it's not, make sure you correct it. So if you have an author affiliation for say the VA hospital or primary children's, um, make sure you don't submit with that as your affiliation. Otherwise you will not be presented with the University of Utah hey, we'll pay your APCs option. So that's the most important thing. The corresponding author has to have a University of Utah affiliation. And if that is the case in the author portal, when your manuscript, if your manuscript is accepted, you will see an option to, hey, would you like to use University of Utah APC, you know, funds to pay your APC? And you say yes. Um, the next step varies from publisher to publishers. Um, for some publishers, once you hit yes, there's nothing else you have to do. Other publishers, when you say yes, the library receives an email saying, hey, professor so-and-so would like to use university funds for this manuscript. Do you approve? We just hit yes, and then the next process moves on. So that's kind of the direction that the libraries and um, the VPR's office are moving in to try and support open access publishing for authors. I wish I could tell you that it was every publisher and every journal. It is not. Um, if you are submitting grant a grant application, I recommend or I suggest that you still write into your budget open access funds to cover open access publishing because then you have the ability to choose any journal right to publish in and the grant funds will pay your um, APC. But this process of transitioning to trying to support um, faculty and staff and clinicians in their role as both readers and content producers um, is moving on and I suspect over the next five years, more and more publishers will um, will be successful in uh, negotiating licenses with more and more publishers. Questions about open access publishing. Um, one of the things that the library can do is if you have a manuscript that you're working on and you want um, guidance in identifying journals that are part of um, various open access agreements, um, you can reach out and say, hey, I've got an article that's about this topic. What are some journals that might be um, good places to submit my manuscript? Okay, so um, I'm just throwing this in here because one of the things that the various author portals have, um, when you say, yes, I would like to publish this article open access and the university is going to pay my fees, um, is that you will be given an option to identify what license terms you want to apply. This is that whole Creative Commons, what, what do I want others to be able to do with my content? So this is where you can say, I'm not 
authorizing commercial use, right? I'm fine with people creating derivative works. Um, the, the first license term is the, you have to give attribution, which is kind of a standard, everyone wants credit, right? Um, but there's just the opportunity to say, this is what I am authorizing other people to do, to do with my work. This is not just for open access publishing. This is really anything that you create where you hold the copyright to it. This is you saying, I'm fine with people doing X, but not Y. And you can apply those terms to your content. Um, and I like to bring this up, and Byron may talk about it when he talks about core, um, is that it's kind of important um, to think about how much of the copyright you want to maintain over your work versus how much you're fine giving away. Um, a lot of people sign away their copyright without really even being aware that that's what they're doing, because oftentimes when you have a manuscript accepted for publication, you're presented by, you know, the publisher presents you with a, here, copyright transfer form, right? Everyone's seen those. Um, and at that point, most people are like, I just need to get this thing published. And they just fill it out and they submit it and they don't never think about it again. But if you fill it out and you send it in, what you have just done is you have signed away your copyright, which means you have no legal right, you have no authority to um, reuse your own work, for example, right? That's one of the rights that the copyright holder maintains. So um, where this really can be um, a problem, and I've seen faculty run into this periodically, is they publish an article, they sign away their copyright, and they're like, oh, well, the images I used in that, in that article, I'm planning on using them in this book that I'm publishing. You can't, not without getting permission from Elsevier or Wiley or whoever published your article. Um, so if you know that you are submitting a manuscript that has content that you're gonna wanna reuse in some way, you can negotiate with the publisher to maintain limited um, copyrights. You can say, you know, Elsevier, I'm fine with you having X, Y, and Z, but I want to retain rights over my images. Um, so just think of, just be aware that that copyright transfer form does have downstream ramifications that you may um, not be comfortable with and that you can, and it's not, um, it's not maybe typical, but it's not unusual for publishers to have authors kind of negotiate that. Here's what I want to maintain uh, rights to, to my work. And there is even, um, um, a, a link here. There is a kind of a, a PDF that you can download and fill out that kind of guides you through thinking about how you want to communicate with a publisher about, about here's what I want. Um, you don't have to use it. There's nothing, it's not a legally required form, but it is a, a format that publishers are fairly used to seeing. Um, I will tell you that if you're trying to negotiate uh, to hold on to some of your rights, it will delay the publication of your article. So if that's a problem, just be aware. Um, but more and more uh, authors are having success in maintaining uh, control over some of the content that they create. Um, so just if that's important for you, particularly if you're going to reuse images and things, just be aware at the submission, um, at the acceptance stage, don't just blindly sign away your copyright or you might run into problems down the road. Okay, a um, couple other things. PubMed, when I said PubMed isn't the be all end all, um, it is still a very important tool and you will use it most of the time. Um, two things to be aware of. There's generic PubMed, just like there's generic Amazon, right? Anyone can browse Amazon just anonymously. Um, anyone can browse PubMed anonymously, but that limits some of what you can do. Um, and generic PubMed only contains links to full text that are on the publisher's website where you have to pay for them. You don't want to go that route. You want to use special PubMed. And there's two ways that you can do that. Special PubMed has links to full text content that the Eccles Library licenses so that you can access it. So there's two ways you can use special PubMed. You can use that particular link. And you notice it has that O tool that stands for outside tool, U Utah Lib. That version of PubMed will have links in it, and I'll show a picture in a minute, that allow you to retrieve full text from our subscriptions without having to go to the publish, publisher site where they're gonna say, that'll be $79 for that article you want. You don't wanna go that route. So number one, you can either go to the special PubMed platform that has that outside tool in it, or you can set up your My NCBI preferences. How many of you tend to sign into PubMed using your NCBI account? Some people do? Okay, so um, for those of you who, that, don't, that don't do that, one reason you might wanna consider setting up your NCBI account to link to, um, the University of Utah's licensed content is 
in addition to having links to our, our content, having a My NCBI account let, lets you do things like set up saved alerts. Um, it'll keep your search history. It's just like when you have an Amazon account, right? Like you can see what, what's been going on, what you've been doing, um, that kind of thing. So those are two ways that you can use PubMed Plus. PubMed for knowledgeable people. Don't use generic. I mean, generic's fine, but you're better than that. You're smarter than that. You want you want the enhanced version. So keep that in mind. Don't use plain PubMed. Um, when you're using special PubMed, you will see next to the article abstract for every article, this find it button. I've kind of covered it in my slide. Um, every article in generic PubMed will have that publisher full text link, which again, they're going to try and charge you for. The library one is that find it link. When you click on that, it will take you through, well, I'm going to show you that in a minute. It will take you through, mm, I don't have a picture of it, so never mind. Um, those, uh, that find it link is going to take you to um, all of the, uh, it'll show you links to the various places where the library subscribes to that article, like where you can get that article. And there may be more than one place, right? We have articles that are on multiple platforms um, and that will give you links to the various places. Not everyone loves PubMed. I don't know why, um, but some people prefer searching in Google Scholar. Google Scholar is totally fine. I recommend that you set up your Google Scholar account also to tie into university subscriptions. So um, if you don't know how to do this, you wanna go into Google, Google Scholar, click on library links, select University of Utah, get it, hit save. Now, when you are using Google Scholar, you will start seeing results on the side that have this get it at UU link that will also find places from our subscriptions where we have access to these articles. So if you're more comfortable with Google Scholar, go for it. Oh, I do have a picture. So those, uh, the find it link in PubMed or that get it link in Google Scholar is going to take you to the library catalog. The reason it does that is the library catalog will provide links to multiple places, all of the places where that article is available. In this case, this article is both available from Science Direct and it's on the Clinical Key platform. That's just good to know because sometimes technology fails us and that else for Science Direct link isn't working, right? So rather than you hitting a wall, dead end, you can come back and try the other link. So, um, okay. So the other thing that I wanna stress um, before I turn this over is Remote access. So I'm trying to think of this as a true statement. I was about to say literally everything, but I think that is true. Literally everything that the library licenses is access to it is controlled by your IP address, right? You have to be on the university network for the publisher to know, oh, I should let Brian read this article because he's part of the University of Utah. If you're not on the university network, as far as Elsevier is concerned, you're just a random person. <laughs> and you may not be authorized to access the su subscription on their website. So you have to be on the university network. Now, when you're in your office and you're on your computer, you are probably hardwired into the university network. And so everywhere you go, everywhere you navigate, the publisher or the vendor site that you land on sees your IP address and they're like, hey, you're part of the University of Utah, come on in. However, most of us don't spend 24 seven, thank God, in our offices on our computers, right? You're on your phone, on tracks, or you're on your iPad, on the beach somewhere, right? Um, and you need to get yourself on the network if you're gonna use any of the library's resources. So there's two options, well, three. One is you never leave your office. Two is you use what's called the easy proxy system. This is specific to the library and it is a web browser specific option. So. Um, on the library's website, you'll see there's this um, off, oh, I don't have a pointer, the off-campus link right down there at the bottom. Um, if you click on that off-campus access button, you will get the CIS login. You'll put in your unit and your password. And after you do that, you'll be sent back to the web page you were on, which in this case was the library website, but you'll see in the URL address bar, it's stuck in that easy proxy piece, right? That's the magic, the easy proxy makes you look like you're on the university IP addresses. And for as long as you don't close that browser window, you will stay on the network. But the minute you shut your browser window, you got ticked off. You'd have to come back onto the easy proxy remote access button to get yourself back on the network. Okay, so that's option one. Um, I will tell you that all of these links 
to uh, resources that you see on the library's webpage, like right there, there's that orange button for clinical key. If you click on that and you are not on the university network, the link for that will notice that you're not. It will prompt you to put in a unit and password, and then it will send you to clinical key. So all of the library's resources on our webpage have that proxy thing embedded into it, but you can also just click on that off-campus access button. Get yourself on the proxy, which means I'm on the IP um, network now, or I'm on the university network now. Um, that's option one. Option two is to download and install the VPN on your device. This is not web session specific. This is just something that you can have on your device. You can launch it. You can sign in. It takes you through your CIS. Um, whoops, it's not me anymore. Um, so it um, you sign into the VPN, put in your CIS password and username and password, and then you, for as long as you stay on your device, anywhere you navigate, you will look like you are on the IP. So, and I think uh, every VPS, VPN session lasts 12 hours, roughly, um, but it doesn't, so you don't have to just access library resources. This is, this is anything. So if you are sitting at home, um, you can launch the VPN and then tootle around, navigate around the web, and anywhere you go, you will be seen as being on the university network. Your IP address will say to that vendor, hey, this person's part of the University of Utah. So, okay. Any questions before I turn it over to my colleague? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Christy, we really appreciate all your hard work. I mean, you, you have no idea how much work she does for us all the time. The other person who does a lot of work for us is Brian Hull. He took over for Nancy Lombardo in 2022, and he's the project director for the Moran Core project. And he's the, the go-to person for all your core questions. So Brian is going to kind of give us an overview of what's been happening on the core. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, so like Kathleen said, uh, I'm the new Nancy. So if you have questions that you had send to Nancy, you can send to me now. Um, so we're going to pivot back to the Moran Corps. I'm just going to go over some of the statistics and just some of the uh, information on the site. Last year, we had 50 new items published, and to date, we've had 30 this year. So overall, over the nine-year or 10-year span of the project, we now have uh, almost 1,300 learning objects of ophthalmology on the Moran Core, which, as Griffin was saying earlier, is extraordinary and really impressive. And um, this partnership between the library and the Moran Eye Center is what makes that possible. And so some more uh, good news is the usage of the website is trending upwards. There was a little bit of a dip in 2022, but uh, last year in 2023, the numbers started rising again. So there were uh, almost half a million people who looked at the website uh, with half a million sessions on it. Um, 600,000 plus page views and 226 countries visited the Moran Corps. So the usage of the site and the breadth of uh, the audience is really significant. And <clears throat> the top 10 countries that visited uh, a lot of Anglosphere, but also India, Philippines, Malaysia, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Egypt uh, were some of the highest users of the Moran Corps. So Anything of yours that is on the Moran core is getting a significant international audience on it. Um, on the YouTube channel specifically, so I think most of you are familiar that we use YouTube to host the video content. So everything that Ethan records and uploads to YouTube gets put on the website, but it's also discoverable and available on YouTube. And the reason for that is everyone's watching videos on YouTube, so you might as well go to where everyone is. Um, and you'll notice that the view uh, the views have subsided a little bit. I I'm interested in if there was a COVID component to that. If maybe the 2020 2021 time, a lot of people might have been looking for uh, medical videos or perhaps had more time to just watch stuff on YouTube. The one thing with YouTube, and I would you know always put a big asterisk and caveat, is that you are really at the mercy of the algorithm. So 
you shouldn't let it hurt your feelings that your views are going down because a lot of that is just completely out of your control and honestly um, isn't a reflection on the content or the usefulness or the impact of the material. It's just more, you know, did some video go viral on eyes and then the suggested videos happen to have something on the brand core, which happens a lot with some of the spikes, but Overall, the subscribers continue to climb. There's almost uh, 40,000 subscribers. Uh, so not only are people watching the material, but they want to see more. They want, you know, the little ding to show up when a new video is published on the uh, um, Morancor YouTube channel and then also the website. And so... Um, that's really it for what I have to say. Uh, just remember, if you have any questions about the website, sections on the website, or just anything to do with the actual publishing of the material, send me an email and I'll be happy to help you out. Thank you. Any questions for Brian? Any questions for Brian? Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask Austin Nakosuko to come up and talk about his uh, this section on cataract and lens. Austin. Not a whole, not a whole lot to say. Uh, I just want to point you out to a new section called cataract surgery pearls um, that have uh, some YouTube videos on sort of how to um, do certain cataract maneuvers or some complex uh, lens um, videos as well. Uh, and I've been adding to that and I'd love for people to add to that as well and um, just send things directly to Brian and uh, they'll get reviewed. I guess I'll review them before they uh, get released. That's all. Any questions for Austin? You're soliciting, right? If anybody's got a cool video. Yeah, I am. Anybody send me send your video. <laughs> okay, cool videos. Uh, need to go. This is a really, really active uh, uh, um, part of our of the course, so you really want to take advantage of it. And then I'd like to have Marisa Mon to come up and talk about her section. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Degree, for having me. I'm Marisa Mon. I'm a COT and a lead trainer at the Moran, the main Moran Eye Center on the third and fourth floor. Um, so I've been at the Moran for 12 years. And in that time, I've been able to uh, use my skills to become a trainer. I was at Mid Valley and now I'm here. Uh, so aspirations, uh, this is very new, uh, is to utilize our current SOP. Uh, for clinical best practices and break that down into bite-sized pieces that are easy to digest for the world and anyone who's uh, going to be training. Um, we want to do some interactive things. So what we have right now is an, a basic anatomy uh, setup, and we're wanting to, that to become more interactive. So Brian's going to help me. Um, and I'd like to do that with a lot of the pieces and parts as well, creating quizzes. Um, and then the next thing is um, I've created Moran basic training, which I call MBT. So we put uh, the new green technicians through MBT and it's about a five day training um, broken down into smaller bits. Uh, and so I want to be able to have, um, you know, any community, any um, specialty to be able to create their own training program, um, utilizing skills checklists, uh, technician tracking, step-by-step, -step, um, you know, refracting training, applination, and then logs. Um, so then um, the the community, the training community can then uh, create their own training program for their own specialty. So those are the aspirations. Um, any questions on that? Okay. Thank you so much for our having global, me. Yeah, <laughs> our global um, division is really interested in this training as well. So um, it, this will be very helpful for the global people. Uh, Ethan. 
uh, is going to help us understand what he can do to help all of us participate in Moran Corps. Don't uh, mind the photo I had more hair and less beard. Um, but I offer recordings and all sorts of AV help so I can record lectures through the auditorium, through Zoom, through Teams, um, or in person with a camera. I can also do voiceover videos. Um, and I'm honestly not sure what else I can point out there. It's, in my mind, fairly straightforward. Does anyone have questions on what I could do or offer for you? So especially for your uh, the, the um, lectures for education, uh, Ethan is your go-to person. Uh, if you want to have him record the lecture and then uh, and then use that as your flipped classroom. So this he's a real resource for us here at Moran. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I just want to tell you about a couple more resources here at the University of Utah. Uh, Judith Warner and Megan C. and Shrava Gunta and I have met with uh, Janine Holmberg of the Intermountain uh, Healthcare and came up with the University of Utah Dizzy School uh, because we get a lot of people with vertigo and visual vertigo and all kinds of weird complaints like that. Many of these patients end up having what we call persistent postural perceptual dizziness or 3PD. And, uh, and we really needed a pathway to help people go through that both on a provider end and also on the patient end. So we worked with the Department of Neurology and we were able to put this uh, dizzy school together. It's a little bit uh, based on the headache school that we started over 10 years ago. And you can send your patients to the headache school where there are multiple lectures. So uh, I've got a lecture on visual aspects of migraine or um, ones on high pressure and headache. And uh, so, and there's one on photophobia and, and other visual complaints. So it's a resource for your patients that you can say, we've got a headache school here at the University of Utah, just Google it. And um, they can listen to a short lecture uh, by one of our faculty. And then uh, the novel library, the Neuro-Ophthalmology Virtual Educational Library. This is a partnership also with Eccles Health Sciences Library and um, the North America Neuro Ophthalmology Society, and we have over 20,000 learning objects. Uh, recently, we added a really nice section called uh, Jonathan Trobe's Fingertips, and it's kind of a course in neuro ophthalmology. There's also a pediatric neuro ophthalmology course, and now we've added a whole new section called Test Your Knowledge. So for residents who want to study for boards, this whole thing is it has imaging, it has clinical vignettes. And then uh, you, and it tells you what the answer is at the end. Uh, so there's all kinds of different learning objects. Um, and this is a plenum sphenoidality. So any questions for our library committee or about Rancor or anything else? Maybe what you do. Thank you. Let us know if, if there's anything else you feel like we need. Uh, we've been adding new sections to the core, you know, all the time based on need. So um, we'll keep on going. A question. Yeah. Oh, is there a question online? The question's online. Just a shout out to Brian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, I was going to say that Um, I think we've done, I mean, I think it's really so impressive, not just novel and Moran Core, but just all the resources that you've put together, Dr. Degree, and, um, and the whole team with the library committee is really cool. I was going to say for the um, cataract, the virtual cataract instrument, it's, I think, the first, like, interactive online module that we launched on Moran Core where you can actually click things, and it's modular learning, and you can go to things, and it can play videos. So that's developed through um, software that we're tr actually trying to purchase just for um, the library use. But I think just thinking outside the box and not just using, you know, videos and um, the articles that we've published and links, but actually, um, I think 
my goal is to create more modular learning, you know, things that even working with Marisa, we could do like modular quizzes or learning for the technicians. Um, and then my next goal was to create like a refractive surgery learning module where people can go through cases. So I think there's a lot more we can do with Marin Core, and we're just kind of, um, I'm excited to kind of see where it goes and expand it. But Brian Hull's awesome. So he's a great resource. And so is everybody that was mentioned today. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. Okay, well, I guess we'll give you guys a good 10 extra 10 minutes. Or was there another question? Like there were some more resources that were like patient focused or, you know, like patient centric. And, and I know Grant Core traditionally has just been more for, you know, other learners, ophthalmologists, residents, fellows. Um, is that something that we're trying to build out as a resource? Because I think we could. It would be amazing if that was one of the things we wanted to grow into, and there's so many things we could do with it. I'm just curious if that was something that that we're talking about for the whole morning before. That's that's a really great comment. Uh, we do have in the core we have the basic ophthalmology kind of it's just sort of basic like for medical students. Um, I do send patients to Moran Core for some lectures I've done, especially my IIH patients. So if they, because they're confused about their diagnosis and they want to understand more, but we could uh, explore a patient portal. Uh, Neuro-ophthalmology has a whole patient portal with handouts on every neuro-ophthalmic condition in English and multiple other languages. Uh, so we could do something that's on novel uh, we could do something similar for ophthalmology. So it could be a, it's it's a really good idea. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the more patient resources that are vetted, uh, you know, everything goes through an editorial process for the core. So everybody has had their uh, pieces peer reviewed by either a section editor or another colleague uh, so that everything is peer reviewed. It, really becomes a resource patients could trust. Um, so that's a great idea. We'll take that to the next meeting and uh, see what we can come up with. And if somebody wants to be an editor of a section, let us know because uh, we, we do need uh, some sections. So thanks so much. Thanks for being Thank here. You.